and uh, the next two hours we're going to talk about emission scenarios and technical options for greenhouse gas emission reduction. Um, so I'm going to cover better CO2 come from, where other greenhouse gases come from. So I'll talk about the Kaya, the T, and the scenarios that are used in this um, literature. And, and then we're going to spend more time on options for emission reduction. And then uh, by the time we reach geoengineering, I'm, well, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Um, um, this is where we are in uh, the lecture sequence. By now, it is clear that there will be a strike. And the strike, if I'm going to follow it, will take out three lectures here. Um, I haven't decided how much I'm going to strike it, uh, if any. Um, so uh, I'll keep you posted uh, on that. Um, so let's turn to uh, the topic. So last week, uh, I showed you this particular graph where we had all the things that affect uh, climate, right? Uh, so this is the past. This is what happened over the last 250, 270 uh, years, really, uh, since 1750. Right? Um, and it's clear that if you want to project what's going to happen to climate into the future, and that's what we're going to do this week, um, you need to project all of these things, right? Not just CO2, um, but also the other greenhouse gases, some of the precursors that affect uh, climate in an indirect way, uh, aerosols, albedo changes, land use change, uh, all of these things matter, right? Uh, so you immediately have an idea that it's actually not a very simple problem, right? There's just complexity by uh, the sheer number of things that you need to do. Um, what I'm going to do is focus firmly on CO2, not because the rest is not important, but simply if I need to discuss all of these things, then this is not an hour and a half, but this is rather 10 hours of lecture, right? Just on constructing scenarios. Um, so I'm going to focus firmly on CO2, not because the rest is not important, but simply uh, to save time. Um, and this is where uh, CO2, uh, rather all the greenhouse gases, uh, come from. In 2010, uh, this data is four. Uh, so most of the CO2 comes from the generation of electricity, a bit less than the generation of heat, a lot less than the generation of heat. Uh, then there's a good bit of CO2 that comes from transport, a good bit of CO2 uh, that comes from manufacturing, mostly chemicals, steels, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the sort of stuff that you do in your home is actually a fairly small share uh, of CO2 emissions. Residential includes small shops, not just homes. Um, and CO2 makes up around 75% of all greenhouse gases coming. Um, methane is about 70% uh, nitrous oxide uh, around 7% uh, and then the halocarbons um, are an even smaller share. Um, so where does the CO2 come from? Uh, most of it is from the combustion uh, of fossil uh, fuels. Um, and this is intrinsic to the process. So if you want to get heat out of a carbohydrate, out of a fossil fuel, what do you do? You essentially add energy and you add oxygen, right? You burn it. Um, and what happens chemically is that you start with a carbohydrate, that is a combination of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms in uh, some sort of uh, molecule. And you see the CO2 molecule. Uh, and what you do if you add heat is that you break the chemical bonds uh, between the C and no, uh, between the C and the H. This is not a carbohydrate at all. This is CO2. Uh, and the breaking of the chemical bond takes energy. That is why you need to put heat to things in order to burn it, right? 
uh, and then you add oxygen as well and then the C of the carbo uh, hydrate goes to CO2 forms a new chemical bond and that is the one you see here and that generates energy and the, uh, the H, the hydrogen is also oxidized it goes to H2O and the forming of the new chemical bonds again releases energy right so that is how we get energy out of fossil fuels this is completely intrinsic to the uh, physics and the chemistry of the process you can't get energy out of oil or coal or gas without forming co2 because it's the formation of co2 that gets you the energy right um, so it's not like sulfur or acid rain if you burn coal, coal is typically impure, there's a, few, a bit of sulfur contained in the coal. If you burn the coal, you also get uh, SO2, sulfur dioxide, which is an acidifying gas and it kills trees and uh, fish and all that stuff. That is an environmental problem and it's an externality because you don't burn coal uh, to kill fish. But it's also a chemical nuisance. Actually, your coal would burn better if there was no sulfur in, if it was just a pure carbohydrate. Not true for CO2. That is completely intrinsic. It's an externality. It causes climate change. But chemically, this is exactly what you want to do, right? Um, so that is where most CO2 comes from. And it's intrinsic to the process. Now. I mentioned fossil fuels, not all fossil fuels are created equal. Uh, if you burn gas, you get around um, 60 tons of CO2 per terajoule of energy. If you burn peat, you get almost, uh, yeah, you get more than twice that amount of CO2 per terajoule of energy. Um, <coughs> so there you immediately have your first option for greenhouse gas emission reduction. You can switch from one fossil fuel to the next. This is a, a picture of CO2 emissions from the US uh, electricity sector uh, between 20, uh, 2001 and 2012. Um, and what you see is that total power generation has actually increased a little bit over this period from 3,700 to 4,000, a little bit more. <coughs> Um, and at the same time, so that is uh, what you see here, that's the top of the line here. At the same time, you see that CO2 emissions, that's the black line, uh, have gone down from around uh, 2200, 2250 to around 2000. So more electricity is made, but at the same time, CO2 emissions are uh, falling. The reason for that is not an expansion of hydro. The reason for that is not the expansion of renewables, here given in green, or the expansion of nuclear. None of that was going on. Uh, really, the, uh, what happened here is that natural gas grew at the expense of coal. So essentially what we have here is the shale gas revolution that uh, they figured out how to get shale gas out of the ground at a reasonable cost. As a result, the supply of natural gas increased, the price of natural gas plummeted, and power companies essentially closed down their coal-fired power plants and opened up new uh, gas-fired power plants. Uh, and that drives uh, drove the CO2 um, emissions down. So this is a substitution within uh, fossil fuels. Now this is a picture for the US. If you were to draw the same picture for Europe, you would see the exact opposite. Why? Two reasons. Um, one, at this time, there was a uh, ban on exports of gas from the United States. This was a leftover from World War II, uh, but nobody ever repealed uh, those laws. Uh, and second, there was no capacity uh, to actually export 
gas because you need to build LNG terminals both for export and for import before you can ship LNG and that takes a while to build these things. <coughs> Uh, so what happened, what did they do with the coal? They essentially shipped it to Europe. So the coal that was not burned here was essentially shipped to Europe, which is easy and legal. And as a result, the price of coal in Europe fell. The price of gas was unaffected. And as a result, in Europe, you see the opposite substitution process going on. That has now been remedied. It's legal to export uh, gas from the US again. Yay. Um, and it's also possible because Europe has built lots and lots of LNG terminals um, more than uh, the US. The US has also built new uh, LNG terminals and you now see uh, that the shale gas from the US is actually reaching European shores. Um, still a lot of it goes to Asia because the price of gas there is higher. Right, so that is your first thing uh, that you can do to reduce CO2 use in the back today. Uh, most of CO2, 80% comes from the burning of fossil fuels. Um, uh, another good bit, around 18%, maybe 17% comes from land use chains. Um, so trees are also carbohydrates. If you cut down trees or you burn down trees and replace them in grassland, which is also carbohydrates, and then you can put cows on and make uh, hamburgers. Um, both grass and trees are carbohydrates, but trees are obviously much bigger and store much more CO2. So if you replace tall trees with short grass, you have to get rid of the CO2 some way uh, or another. And typically that ends up in the atmosphere because those trees are typically burnt, right? But also if you left them to rot, actually the CO2 eventually ends up in the atmosphere. Um, so that is the se second main source of carbon dioxide. And then the third one, is cement production. Again, this is intrinsic to the process. You start with limestone. The problem with limestone is that it's not very good as a building material. And the reason for that is that there's too much carbon in limestone. So you heat it up to drive out the carbon to turn the limestone into cement. And then you vent the carbon, you oxidize it, and you vent it into the atmosphere. Right? Um, that's the way you make cement from limestone, right? By driving out the carbon. Um, <coughs> the second most important thing that goes after CO2 anthropogenic greenhouse gas uh, is methane, uh, CH4. Um, there's two main and two minor sources of this. Uh, the biggest source for methane are ruminants cattle and camels and uh, that sort of animals. Um, and again, this is something that is very deep in the structure of uh, the sector. Um, so why do we keep cattle? Uh, for two reasons. One is to make milk and the other is to make meat. Uh, what do uh, cows do? They eat grass and they turn that into uh, milk, right? If you compare the chemical balance of grass with the chemical balance of milk, both are carbohydrates, but you see that there's too much hydrogen in the grass, right? Somehow in the transformation process, the same is true for steak or hamburgers, somewhere in the transformation process, you need to get rid of the excess hydrogen. So how do cows do that? Um, well actually, hydrogen is pretty dangerous uh, for two reasons. If you have hydrogen floating around in an uh, environment with lots of oxygen, it turns into a hydrogen radical, OH, and hydrogen radicals, as the name suggests, destroy everything. Everything they touch essentially gets uh, degraded. Uh, so that is a pretty dangerous thing to do. Um, but in an oxygen poor environment, like a cow's stomach, there is not a lot of hydro, uh, not a lot of oxygen, fortunately. Uh, so they need to get rid of the hydrogen in another way. And the second route, preferred route for hydrogen, is to go from a hydrogen atom to a hydrogen molecule, H2. And the problem with that is that it's flammable uh, and it floats, right? 
hydrogen gas is what makes zeppelins go uh, up in the sky. So if you have a stomach full of hydrogen gas, you start floating, right? Which is not a good solution either uh, for uh, a cow. Um, so what they've done, <coughs> actually I don't know, I think it's hundreds of millions uh, of years ago, they formed a symbiotic relationship with methanogenetic, methanogenic, methanogenic, uh, is the word I'm looking for, bacteria, who, who essentially sacrifice one useful carbon atom to get rid of four dangerous hydrogen atoms, and those bacteria in uh, the cow's gut turn the H into CH4, and then that gas is that's innocent, essentially, and that burp that out, right? Uh, so that is where uh, the CH4 in agriculture or in the, the, the livestock sector uh, comes from. And you can wonder, how do we get rid of this? And the natural solution is if you look at a similar type of animal, or an animal that has the same ecological needs, that is, it, it eats grass, other forms of vegetation, and produces meat and milk, and the, another animal that does this is the kangaroo. And the kangaroo does not produce methane. The kangaroo produces acetate. It also is very rich uh, in hydrogen, and it poops that out. So you may think that the best way of getting rid of the CH4 from cattle is to switch to kangaroo steak and kangaroo milk. That would be an option. Or to manipulate the metabolism of the cow so that it becomes the metabolism of the kangaroo. But those family lines sort of separated also a long, long time ago. I'm not going to hazard a guess, but uh, probably we're talking hundreds of millions of years ago. Um, so this is a, another uh, tough order, right? <coughs> now, there are recent developments that suggest that you can manipulate the cow's diet to get rid of most of the CH4 through uh, feeding them seaweed, uh, but that is yet to be proven to work uh, at scale. Um, so that is an important source of methane. Another important source of methane uh, is paddy rice, that's wet rice. Uh, so we're interested in eating the grain. Uh, rice plants actually make a lot of leaves. Those leaves drop uh, into uh, the water and then they rot. Uh, so if things rot in an oxygen-rich environment, then it becomes CO2. If it rots in an oxygen-poor environment, it becomes C uh, H4. And of course, if it's underwater, it's an oxygen poor environment. Um, very little you can do about this. Petty rice is by far the best way of getting calories off a plot of land if you live in the tropics. This is just simply the most productive agriculture uh, around. Um, a minor source of methane is waste, same story. You eat an apple, you throw your apple in the bin, uh, the bin gets emptied uh, eventually into a landfill, it's covered with other waste, you have organic material that needs to rot in an oxygen poor environment, the only way your apple core can go to uh, CH4, right? Um, and uh, finally, uh, leakage. Um, I'm calling this methane, and I'm referring it to, to, uh, to it as CH4. Uh, if CH4, the chemical substance, is a nuisance, we call it methane. But if it's useful, we call it natural gas. Those two things are identical. Uh, so if you uh, digging up gas out of the ground, so you're transporting it over long distance, always something goes wrong, your pipelines are never fully sealed and so on and so forth, and some of that stuff is simply leaked into the atmosphere. Uh, the same is true if you're uh, drilling for oil. Oil often is found together uh, with gas that gets leaked into the atmosphere, sometimes it gets uh, flared. Same is true if you're digging for coal, there's often bubbles of 
petrol gas there as well that are simply vented into the atmosphere. Right? Um, nitrous oxide, the third most anthropogenic greenhouse gas, again comes from agriculture. Um, it essentially comes from the over application of fertilizers. Farmers are risk averse, they put fertilizers cheap. As uh, so a farmers put on too much fertilizer, more than the plants need strictly, because they are risk averse, better to uh, put in a little bit too much fertilizer than risk a bad harvest. Uh, that excess nitrogen, some of it is converted in the soil to nitrous oxide. Uh, and that's a pretty powerful greenhouse gas as well. Um, and then, <laughs> probably in week 11, we're going to talk a little bit, as well as in week 4, we're going to talk about the other uh, greenhouse gases. Right? Uh, so let's return to CO2. Um, this is a, a data set that came out earlier this week. Uh, so not fully processed in yet. Um, this is uh, energy use worldwide. Um, it is not very special. Uh, the special thing is that um, it starts in 1820. So they reconstructed global uh, energy use. Um, and what you see is or, uh, energy use has expanded uh, quite a bit uh, since over the last 200 years. Um, a lot of that early expansion came uh, from coal, later followed on uh, by oil, gas came later. Um, and this is where, um, this is how we uh, globally uh, use uh, energy. Uh, the, the perhaps more revealing picture uh, is this, which is the same data but not just shown as a share. Uh, and what you see is that yes, the composition of the energy supply, or in this case energy demand, changes over time. Uh, but the substitution away from fuel wood to coal to heat our homes, uh, that happened in the 19th century, was a very gradual transition, right? Yes, things change, but things don't change very rapidly. These transitions take decades. Um, so the current plans that have been announced to decarbonize the economy by 2030, uh, by 2050, and um, by 2030 cut our emissions by 40% or so, those are very ambitious things, right? You may sort of think 2030 is 10 years in the future, and 2050 is 30 years into the future, right? All sorts of things can change. Uh, a lot of people are sort of conditioned by how things develop in software, in mobile phones, and that sort of stuff where things have changed very rapidly, right? Where you can have companies like Google and Facebook go from nothing to world domination in a matter of decades where technologies are replaced all the time. That is true for certain sectors in the economy. It's absolutely not the case for energy, where coal-fired power plants have a lifetime of 60 years. Right? So if you build that thing, chances are it will still be there. If you build that thing today, chances are it will retire in 2080. Right? Um, and this sort of much slower motion that is still a characteristic of the energy sector um, is something that people don't quite think about when they um, when they come up with these ambitious plans to cut emissions uh, rapidly. Um, so, uh, a bit of analytics. Uh, and I'm going to restrict my attention, uh, because I haven't fully processed the data that I just showed you. Now I'm going to restrict my attention to data that came out of the World Bank. Um, and we're going to look at uh, CO2, starting in 1970. And the black line that you see here is global emissions of carbon dioxide um, from fossil fuel combustion. So no more methane, no more nitrous oxide. Um, no more land use change, 
uh, no more cement. This is just CO2 from uh, fossil fuel combustion. And what you see is that since uh, 1970, uh, data here in 2012, data actually only goes to 2014. Um, <coughs> for reasons that I don't quite understand. Um, what you see is that over this period, CO2 emissions worldwide more than doubled, increased by 270. 5%, something like that. <coughs> and then the question you may ask, how come? And that would be a useful question to ask because you want to know how these things could, would develop into the future. Um, and for that, we can use the so-called uh, Kaya identity. Um, and that is given here. And what does the Kaya identity say? It says that emissions E equal the number of people there are, P, times per capita income, y over p, times the energy intensity of the economy, x over y, that is how much energy, how much sterile you'll be need for a million uh, pounds of uh, value added, <coughs> um, and then again times the emission intensity of the energy sector, how much CO2 we emit for the energy that we use. Um, and this is an identity, it is true, because P cancels against PY, against Y, and X against X. So what we have here is that E equals E, right? And it's very hard to argue with it. Now, uh, identities are true. Uh, some identities are also useful, and this one is useful. Uh, because it says that if we're interested in E, we can split it up into four components and see how those four components uh, behave. Uh, so we know that uh, CO2 emissions more than doubled. Uh, this is the growth of the world population. Everything is indexed to one in 1970. And what you see is that the number of people less than doubled over this period, grew by 180% or so, uh, which immediately implies that CO2 emissions per capita increased, right? Because CO2 grew faster than uh, the population. Um, if you look at income per capita, the second component of the uh, high identity, we see that the average person is now about twice as rich as he was in 1970. Um, if we take the two together, right, then we see that the world economy has expanded by more than 400%. CO2 emissions grew by only slightly more than 200%. So that immediately implies that the emission intensity of the economy has fallen, and has fallen quite considerably, right? And that's the next two components. Uh, here we're looking at the energy intensity of the economy, which you see is that over this 14 and a bit year uh, period, almost halved, that is we use half as much energy per pound value added than we used to 45 years ago. It's quite impressive, right? Um, uh, and then the final component of the Kaya identity, the green line, did hardly do anything at all. So what we see is a slight intensification. This is more and more coal use. Uh, then we switch to gas in Europe and then later uh, in the US. Um, and then India and China started growing and burning lots of coal. And basically nothing else happened here. Right? So all of the action has been, all of the positive action in terms of uh, emission reduction, has been in energy intensity, not in switching fuels. Right? Um, So that is how you can deconstruct the past and see what happens, right? Uh, we're interested in the future. Uh, and last week I showed you uh, this particular graph, right, where we have the observed temperature, global mean surface air temperature, and then projected global mean surface air temperatures into the future. And then I said, well, the different colors are different ways in which the future might unfold. 
that comes from these sort of exercises. Um, so what people have done is use the chi identity, and this is ELC uh, chi, um, to project emissions into the future, or something very similar to uh, the chi identity. Uh, so if you want to know <coughs> how much CO2 will be emitted in the year 2050 or in the year 22, uh, 2100, then what you need to do is predict how many people there will be, how rich those people will be, how much energy they will use, and what sort of energy they will use. And then you've got your CO2. And then if you want to predict your methane in the year 2100, you need to know how many people there will be, how rich they will be, how much they will eat, and what they will eat, and so on and so forth, right? And you immediately see that this is a hard problem, right? Somebody at Macro should have told you how difficult it is to predict uh, economic growth, right? The other components are not any easier. Um, so, <coughs> some say brave, some say foolish souls have done this. Uh, these are the latest uh, sets of s scenarios from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. These are the set of scenarios that drive the big climate models, which in turn drive the impact models, which in turn drive the headlines in the newspapers that you see, right? Um, and uh, supposedly uh, also drive uh, policy. Um, there is, I know, five groups of scenarios, five ways in which the future might unfold, uh, and they're here split according to um, the chi identity. <coughs> so this is a uh, projected uh, population given in billions of people. Uh, you see quite substantial differences between scenarios. There is the uh, scenarios that say that the population by the end of the century will be 7 billion. Then there's around uh, a group of scenarios around 9 billion. And then there's also scenarios that say uh, no, 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 it's going to be 13 billion by the end of the century. This scenario used to be the default scenario. At the moment, this is the default scenario. This is what the demographers believe is the more likely one. Uh, where does this switch come from? Where did we go from 7 to 14 billion in a century, more than 80 years? Um, all has to do with fertility. So uh, during uh, the last decade or so of the previous century, fertility in Africa was falling very rapidly. And the demographers thought, well, this is the new normal. Fertility will continue to fall rapidly. And that is how they build their models. And if you believe that this trend continues uh, into the indefinite future, uh, you end up with seven, maybe eight billion people by the end of the century. That was for the period 1990 to 2000. If you look at a longer period, 1950 to the year 2000, uh, fertility fell, but not nearly as fast. Uh, and what happened after the year 2000, because of the Great African War and all those sort of things, um, <coughs> Fertility started or continued to fall, but much, much more slowly. And in some parts of Africa, it's actually rising again. Um, and that is why the demographers changed their minds and now actually have much, much more children built into uh, the future. And <coughs> we end up with a much more popular world. Um, <coughs> So don't think that projecting population growth is easy, right? On the one hand, it is easy because there's a lot of momentum in the system. I'm looking at a bunch of 20-year-olds uh, at the moment. 
high chance that the majority of you guys, the vast majority of you guys, will have babies within the next 20 years, right? So in that sense, population growth is very predictable. But what happens after, right? How many children you will decide to have? That's actually much more uncertain, right? Um, <coughs> A simple mechanics then yes, this 20 to 35 year old women that have babies, that is a sort of momentum that is building, but all the other things are actually going to be very neutral. Here we're looking at per capita income, um, and what you see is five alternative ways in which the future may be. Um, the most pessimistic scenario has that income doubles by the end of the century. At the moment, the average income is around $7,000 uh, per person per year. That will go to, you know, it's a bit higher, it will go to $20,000. It's a very comfortable income, right? That's Portugal levels. That is the world average. That seems to be a, um, a reasonably comfortable world. you see is that this is the most pessimistic scenario. Why is this? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as the name suggests, is run by governments. It's essentially a UN body. And, and even though we see that large parts of the world have stagnated in their income, large parts of Africa, people are as poor as they were just after World War II, and in some parts of Africa, people are actually poorer uh, than they were 80 years ago. Here we have steady economic growth everywhere. And the reason for that is that this is a UN body, and basically all governments in the world have to sign off, and no government ever signs off on a scenario where they become poorer, right? So the most pessimistic scenario is essentially censored uh, by governments, right? So we have steady economic growth in the most pessimistic scenario, and in the most optimistic scenario, from an income perspective, the average per capita income goes to $140,000 per person per year. The average of the world, right? Will be richer than Luxembourg is now. The average income in Luxembourg is around $110 per person per year at the moment. Beggars believe, right, that we could be so rich in an 80 years time. Um, then again, if you look at 1940, which is 80 years ago, people were a lot poorer than that. People in 1940 would not believe the technologies that you guys have, would not believe how rich you are, right? Even though as students you are amongst the poorest uh, in the UK, people in 1940 would think you guys incredibly rich right? and probably me unimaginably rich right so maybe this is true it would be a very peculiar world right where the average income <laughs> average income is 140k um energy intensity so the black line here is what energy intensity has done over the last 40 years. I've shown that picture. And then you see that scenarios essentially project this forward. And energy intensity will continue to fall. With the income bar, Yeah, everybody's richer, so in terms of your relative standing in society, that hasn't changed. But in terms of just what you can do with that sort of money, it's uh, better to believe, right? Um, I mean, it's just better to believe, right? What the <laughs> world would be like. This is very, very, very difficult to imagine, right? So you see sometimes uh, life of the rich, uh, famous, right? A typical program on TV or on YouTube or whatever. I mean, Paris Hilton has a three-story house for her dog, right? With original art on the wall, 
that's what you will do with I mean, you have so much money that you don't know you can't satisfy your own needs possibly ever right but anyway <laughs> I don't know what a world like this would be would look like but then again as I said people in 1940 could not possibly know what a world would look like in um, <laughs> energy and density you see models essentially <laughs> Projecting the historical trends. Um, this is a, re a wide range of results. It seems to be uh, a reasonable uh, depiction. Uh, there is, of course, a physical lower limit, right? That you have the laws of thermodynamics at one point kicking in, that you can't certain things just take energy, and you can't just keep reducing the energy to the speed of perhaps not the uh, <coughs> And then uh, we look at the CO2 intensity, um, where we see some scenarios becoming quite optimistic. So a lot of switching to renewables is going on. Uh, some of them say, oh, we're going to basically uh, stay uh, where we were. And you actually also see some increases um, in CO2 intensity. <coughs> and you may sort of say, well, this is a reasonable range, or this is a wide range of possible futures. Uh, so that is what you would expect. Um, some of these things that are going on here are peculiar. Because we are now at a situation that wind and solar are beginning to compete with coal. And it's very hard to imagine that we would somehow lose that technology, that we would somehow forget how to make photovoltaic cells, that we would somehow forget how to build a wind turbine. That's not going to happen, right? We know how to do these things and they have been coming steadily cheaper over the last decades so why would it become more expensive all of a sudden uh, whereas for coal we actually know that the easily accessible coal is gradually running out and we're getting ever deeper into the ground in an ever to, into ever more remote uh, territory so coal is becoming more expensive and wind is becoming less expensive so it's very hard to imagine a future where people would voluntarily build coal-fired power plants or continue to build them. The, the economics is simply not there. And I'm, when I'm talking about going into remote territory, in order to get here, what you need is to go to Antarctica, the South Pole, to dig out coal. It's very inhospitable, A. It's very far away. So the coal that you dig out there is going to be expensive. It's very hard to imagine that it would ever, ever compete with solar, even if solar doesn't improve uh, on its uh, current. <laughs> but uh, that is what is in some of the models and some of the more dramatic headlines that you see in the newspaper, uh, very rapid warming over this century, are driven by these scenarios where there is a return to coal. Was that a question? No. Um, so something <laughs> in my peripheral vision. A lot of the more dramatic scenarios that you see in the newspapers are about a return to coal. That we're running out of gas, which we are, and we're going to switch back to uh, coal. Um, so, <coughs> talked about emissions and uh, emission scenarios and I've given you the chi identity uh, and I've given started talking about how to reduce emissions because that is of course a more interesting uh, question um, <coughs> the chi identity also tells us how we can reduce emissions uh, so I've given you the chi identity E is P times the Y of P times that's over Y times E over X if this is true, if two things are equal to each other, then transformations of those things are also equal to each other. So what we can do is take the log on both sides of the equation, and then it's still true, because if E is E, then log E must be equal to log E. Duh. Um, and then if you take the first partial derivative to time, then uh, we have something that is still true. So B L D T is equal 
and PDT for the and YDT for the and XI for the and here, where Y is Y for B and XI is X over Y and e. I is X, uh, E over X. Now this may be a notation that you're not particularly familiar with, uh, but this is a proportional growth rate. But B, L, and E, D, T is, by the chain rule, uh, the E, D, T times 1 over E, right? Because the first partial derivative of log E is 1 over E, right? So we take the derivative of L and E, so D, T is 1 over E, and then we're left with the chain rule uh, with D, E over uh, D, T, which is the chain in E over E, so this is a proportional growth rate. So the growth rate of emissions is the growth rate of the population plus the growth rate of the capita income plus the growth rate of energy intensity plus the growth rate of carbon intensity. Right? That follows from the chi identity. So if you want to reduce emissions, <coughs> this thing has to go negative, right? That is what reducing emissions mean. And the growth rate becomes negative. It shrinks. Um, there's four things you can do. You can have fewer people around. Um, that would be effective. It would also be a brilliant way of not getting elected again, right? In Europe, to a lesser extent in North America, uh, if as a politician you want to mess with people's decisions about fertility, you are in trouble. That is something that people decide for themselves and as a government you don't want to control this. Um, that is not to say that it's not an effective policy, right? If you look at the behavior of the government of Sudan uh, or the governments of Zimbabwe, right? Actively driving people away, in Zimbabwe's case, actively killing people, uh, if you're talking about Sudan or Syria for that matter. Uh, it is a very effective way of shrinking your economy and shrinking your emissions. Um, not a very popular way. Uh, Assad is not the most beloved leader in the world. Um, China, for a very long time, until today, claims at international gatherings that its one-child policy is its major contribution to international climate policy. It's complete nonsense, right? Because the one-child policy was introduced for reasons that are completely unrelated to climate. But this is the official Chinese position. That its one-child policy has reduced emissions substantially and we should be grateful to China for not emitting much, much more than they do. Right? should ask uh, a Chinese historian uh, for the details because, I mean, everything that happens in China is complicated. Um, essentially, they were afraid of rapid population growth. They were afraid that they would be unable to feed their population and would be unable to give them a decent standard of living if a population growth would sort of revert to older times. Um, of course, they've landed themselves into trouble there because now China is one of the, fa is one of the fastest growing populations. They don't have a very robust pension system and its dependency ratio, the number of, uh, uh, the number of economically inactive people relative to the total population or to the size of the working population is rapidly increasing. China has a big problem, partly because of its one child policy. So they, com they completely got this wrong. Okay, but I'm not a China expert, so there's much more subtle ways of uh, <laughs> talking about this than I could ever do. Um, so reducing population growth is one option. Uh, reducing economic growth is your second option, also very effective. Uh, so this is the former uh, Soviet Union, uh, which fell apart uh, roughly around this time. Deep, deep, deep economic crisis, right? Uh, so that is in red. Uh, no, 
that's in blue with deep, deep, deep economic crisis, and what you see in red is that emissions just came with it, right? Um, now being reverse, emissions are not growing that much anymore because uh, this collapse was essentially a collapse in heavy industry, right? And that heavy industry is not coming back. The heavy chemicals and the steel industry has not really returned uh, to uh, this part of the world. But it's a very effective strategy, right? Again, very few political parties would ever stand on a platform of economic strength and get re-elected. The Tories in 2019 are, as far as I know, the only exception where a party promised, well, they did not, they lied, right? Everybody knew that the outcome of the program would be a severe economic pain in the UK, but they got re-elected nonetheless, right? Because people, whatever. Um, but typically, if you promise economic pain, you won't get re-elected, right? Uh, so that means that there's only, if you don't want to mess with population growth and you don't want to mess with economic growth, that means that you have only two options left to reduce your emissions, right? So you need to improve your energy intensity and you need to improve your carbon intensity. And not just that, right? If you want your emissions to fall, then your energy intensity and your carbon intensity need to improve so fast that you overcome population growth and economic growth, right? If you set population growth to roughly zero, slightly above zero, uh, but set this at two or three percent per year, it seems to be uh, what people uh, expect, and you want this to be negative, it has to be bloody fast, right? The first thing you can do is save energy. Essentially make the same stuff with less energy, right? And there's two ways of doing that. One is technological change and the other is behavioral change. Now if we focus on technology and we look at a single product, then what we see is that technology always improves. Um, so I showed you uh, this particular graph. Here we are. Uh, this purple line always seems to be improving. And if you look at a particular technology, that has gone back a long, long time. So it goes back here to 1970, Bill Nordhaus, uh, the last year's Nobel laureate, has this fabulous paper uh, where he looks at the energy efficiency of lighting going back to Babylonian times. And what you see, if you look at the amount of lumens, the measure of light uh, that you get per money that you put into the fuel and the technology, it has steadily improved for, remember the Babylonians, uh, for three and a half thousand years. And the reason for that is simple. Uh, energy is a cost. If you as a company can deliver the same product that behaves in the same way, costs the same price, but uses less energy, then people will want to buy your stuff because it's cheaper to run, right? Mm -hmm. So if you sell a fridge with the same volume as the uh, competition has, the same color, the same dimensions, the same price, but you use less electricity to run that fridge, it's cheaper to run, and people will buy your stuff, right? So there is this constant competitive pressure to reduce the cost of products, and one way of doing so is by using less energy. <laughs> so if you look at a comparable product over time, it always gets better, right? Because people don't buy the inferior stuff, essentially. Um, <coughs> now that is not generally true. Uh, because these savings can go elsewhere. <laughs> so what we're looking at here is the uh, US car industry. This is the fuel economy of newly sold cars. We're in the US. Uh, so the unit of fuel economy is miles per gallon. A gallon is 4.2 liters or something, 4.4. Um, and a mile, of course, we know. I haven't quite switched the measure. 
And, and what you see that what I just told you that technology always improves uh, is not true, right? Because essentially the fuel economy has been flat since the early 80s for 30 years uh, <coughs> until the start of the previous decade. I know. Why? <coughs> Well, if you look at two other trends that are going on in the U.S. Uh, automotive sector, is that cars have gotten considerably heavier. It's not something that you would notice, but what you would have noticed is that cars in the U.S. have grown considerably in size, right? You see some of these things popping up at U.K. roads, and they have nothing compared to the cars that you would see in the U.S., right? They are big. And because they are big, they're also heavy, and you see actually a very rapid increase in the weight of the cars. <coughs> and because they're heavier, you need a more powerful engine to lump all that steel uh, with you. Uh, so the next round that you see here is the average horsepower of newly sold cars. And now you see an incredible feat of engineering. <coughs> So you see ever bigger and ever heavier cars with ever more powerful engines, but not an increase in, in uh, fuel use. This is very good engineering, right? You deliver ever more power without using more energy. <coughs> so in the US, people have not opted for using less energy and therefore emitting less CO2, they have opted for more comfortable cars, safer cars, rather than more energy efficient cars, right? So this technology can also be directed uh, in other directions rather than into fuel savings. And, and that's a consumer choice, right? Um, <coughs> another way of saving energy is through, there we are, uh, is through uh, behavior. <coughs> if you ask an engineer, uh, they will tell you that about 30% of energy we use has no useful purpose. Uh, <coughs> people do all sorts of strange things, use way too much energy uh, than they need. Uh, for instance, they go to the bathroom, they turn on the light, they leave the bathroom and leave the light on. There's nobody there, why shoot? Like beyond, uh, people want to make a cup of tea. They fill the kettle with water, boil uh, it all, take out a little bit of water to fill their cup, and let the rest of the water cool down. Right? Uh, which is pure waste. Um, problem. Mm, this is undoubtedly true. The problem is that it's actually very difficult to change behavior like this. Uh, there have been numerous campaigns by the government to tell people to behave more sensibly. That does not really work. Um, also, social pressure uh, may actually be uh, not as effective uh, as some would have hoped, and there's all sorts of negative consequences, right? Uh, presumably, a number of you share uh, an apartment with others. You may share uh, your house with an energy Nazi, right? Somebody who goes around and tells you <coughs> to turn up the light, and don't boil so much water, and so on and so forth, and turn down the thermostat, those situations can become very unpleasant, right? <coughs> um, so this is not uh, necessarily easy uh, to, to change. Um, some of these problems are a little bit uh, deeper and are essentially what an economist would call a principal agent problem. If you um, walk around campus after five, what you would notice is that there's a lot of lights on, even though the room is empty. And that is just a pure waste of energy. And the question is, how would you change that? And uh, the rules are very simple. Um, that is that the lecturer, me, is responsible for turning off the lights, turning off the equipment at the end of the lecture. But I do not pay the electricity bill. Vice Chancellor does. It's not that if I turn off the lights, then my research account would increase or my salary would increase. No, this all goes to the university. It's a common problem. Why should I care? Why should I make the effort of turning up the equipment rather than 
running up and doing something more uh, useful or interesting. <coughs> now this is a principal agent problem. Uh, I am the agent. I am responsible for the resource use in this classroom. The principal, as the vice chancellor, is the one who pays the bills, right? And if principal and agent are two different people and there's not a complete contract between them, then they simply won't work. Now this is the smallest problem. Uh, the same happens in the housing market. Presumably you all rent. And if you lease a house, then you are responsible for paying the energy bills. But your landlord or landlady is responsible for the physical state of the apartment or the room. And you, according to your contract, are not allowed to change things. You are not allowed to put in loft insulation. You are not allowed uh, to put in double glazing. You are not allowed to change uh, your heating system. That is the job of the landlord and landlady. But you pay the energy bill, so it would be in your interest to put in double glazing. You may argue <coughs> that it's also in the landlord's interest to put in double glazing because then he can charge a higher rent, but those signals are not fully transmitted uh, in the rental market at all. So again, you have a separation of those who are paying the bills and are interested in therefore reducing energy use, and those who can actually make those decisions. Right? Um, these principles can be solved in uh, these problems can be solved in principle, but hard in practice. Right? So essentially, if we want to reduce energy use uh, on campus, what we need is a complete contract. That is, I walk into the door, I swap my card, the lights go on, and the electricity bill comes from my research account or from my teaching account. That is essentially what we need to do, right? which is a complete overhaul of the way university money uh, is handled. right? Um, so these things are not, I mean, they're potentially there, but they're actually hard uh, to do. Um, and definitely for a government, uh, they're hard to do. Boris Johnson can stick his head on telly and tell you to use less energy, but you're not going to respond to that. Uh, the demand for energy services is even harder uh, to change. If you take your holiday in Brighton then in, rather than in Bangkok, you save a lot of energy but it's hard to convince people that this is a good idea, right? Um, if you turn down your thermostat and put on uh, warmer clothes, that is a good idea for the environment, but it's very hard to convince people that they should sacrifice this level of comfort, right? Um, <coughs> so, hard uh, to do uh, these things. Um, Switching uh, away um, from fossil fuels is your next uh, option. Uh, so already talked about uh, substitution within fuels. Um, within fossil fuels, you can also switch to uh, completely different sources um, of energy. Uh, and that is uh, necessary <coughs> because we are running out of uh, conventional oil and gas. Um, so this is <coughs> a complicated graph um, with different colors uh, and different fuels. So <coughs> this is an estimate of how much is in the ground in terms of the gaseous fuels, the liquid fuels, and the solid fuels, right? So that is the first thing you see on the graph. And this is an estimate of how much of the stuff is left in the ground. Um, <coughs> and uh, that comes in four different uh, colors here. The reserves are those things where we know where they are and we know that we can get them out of the ground with current technology, at current prices, at a profit. Right? That's the definition of a reserve. Uh, so that is the uh, gas in Qatar and the oil in Saudi Arabia, right? We know uh, <coughs> that we can dig these things up. <coughs> and then there are those things that we suspect are there, or that we suspect we may be able to get out of the ground. Uh, 
if technology improves or uh, if prices change. Uh, and there are those things coming, gradations, uh, <coughs> resources that are proved probable or possible, right? Um, so that is uh, the different colors. Uh, and then the horizontal axis is how much CO2 do we add to the atmosphere if we would burn all this stuff in one go? It's not a sensible thing to do because of the oxygen uh, that we would take out of the atmosphere. One, <laughs> what would we do with all that heat and all that power, right? Uh, <coughs> so this is important. Um, and you don't understand these scales, right? Um, if we want to sort of stay within the Paris uh, agreement targets, then perhaps we can add another 100 parts per million to the atmosphere, right? But this is sort of the Paris uh, ends. Uh, and what you see is that it's very easy to make the world much warmer, right? We just add up all this stuff. And yes, there's a lot of fossil fuels left in the ground uh, for us to burn. Uh, but what you also see is that if you look at the proven reserves of natural gas and the reserves of conventional oil, I'm actually roughly at Paris. So if we burn all the gas in Russia and Qatar and we burn all the oil in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, then we're still not close to the Paris standard. It means two things. One is that the political debate is completely misconstrued, right? Where Exxon Mobile is often portrayed as the boogeyman of uh, climate. No, they're innocent. It's not the Saudis. It's not the Russians that do it. Right? Because if we burn all their stuff and they have the ground, then we're still below, um, below the, or roughly about uh, the Paris so that is one thing you notice, and the other thing is you can burn all the gas in Russia and all burn all the oil in Saudi Arabia and it would not get very hot. And we're running out of this stuff, right? Within your lifetime for uh, oil, conventional oil, within my lifetime probably for natural gas, we're running out of the stuff. And that immediately implies that there is something else that will need to come in its place, right? Um, and that is where the unconventional gas comes in, and the unconventional oil. Um, the oil shale, it's not the same as shale oil. Um, lots of that stuff. Or, and we must uh, return to the solid fuels, return to the coal. So that is the other implication of this graph is that the energy sector that at the moment drives, is driven by this and this, that will come to an end within a matter of decades. And something will need to replace it. And that is, of course, a good news story for climate policy, that sort of the problem will go away. It may be that it's replaced by a different problem for, uh, for climate policy, but may also be that we replace it as something that is not a problem for climate, right? But in 50 years' time, the Saudis have run out of oil. Whatever that may mean for geopolitics, whatever that may mean for the energy sector, in 40, 50 years' time, Russia will have run out of natural gas. Right, and Qatar. Um, and something will have to take its place. <coughs> and that something could be alternative, unconventional uh, oil and gas, um, but it could also be uh, renewables. <coughs> um, we have a whole bunch of renewables that are carbon neutral, uh, or in case of nuclear, something that is carbon neutral. Um, and they all have their problems. Um, nuclear and hydro are proven technologies. Hydro is relatively cheap, but they're very, very difficult to push through politically. There's a lot of resistance um, against hydro because you need a big dam and you need to replace millions of people, which is very, very difficult. You need to destroy a lot of nature, uh, which is very, very difficult. 
Um, nuclear is also a lot of resistance. People are scared uh, of nuclear, even though they shouldn't be anymore, uh, and so on and so forth. And expanding nuclear is proven uh, difficult, and then building nuclear to the acceptable standard uh, in Western Europe has turned out to be very, very expensive. Um, so there's a few nuclear power plants being built around Europe at the moment. Uh, the one that is furthest along is the one in Finland that I now think is something like four times its original budget. Like absolutely crazy. The first problem was that the French engineers went in and thought they were in France so they poured concrete that was working fine in France but they were in Finland and the Finnish winters are a bit colder uh, than French winters. So they had to take out all the uh, take out all the concrete and pour it new, um, and sort of double their budget. Um, also, the things that are being built uh, in or being planned to be built uh, are being planned to be built in the UK. Turn out to be very, very expensive. Um, so it's hard to see much of a future uh, for these two. Uh, wind and solar look perhaps more uh, promising. Um, it says here that they are expensive, which is true. Um, for most uh, things, wind is now competitive with, more than competitive, uh, with coal in Texas, because there's a lot of wind there. Um, land is cheap. Uh, solar also in these applications is actually uh, competitive uh, with fossil fuels. If we look at what uh, happened to these prices, uh, and this is actually over the last decade or so, you just see this steady progress towards lower and lower costs. <coughs> now, um, these numbers may not mean a whole lot to you. Uh, so wind in 2016 at a price range of 32 to 62. And uh, this is dollars per megawatt hour. Coal is about 40. Gas is around 60. That's competitive at the margin, right? Uh, solar is a little bit more expensive. Um, okay, this is all uh, photovoltaics. Um, but it's four years ago was approaching 50, right? Last, no, the year before last, uh, there was a competition in Morocco about concentrated solar power, which is not photovoltaics, essentially building big uh, mirrors and concentrating all this solar light in one spot and heating a lot of water or salt or something like that. Uh, <coughs> concentrated solar power in Morocco two years ago the company that won the auction bid for three cents a kilowatt hour, which is a quarter cheaper than coal in Morocco. Um, and what they're currently bidding in the North for North Sea wind is, um, what was it, 35 cents? Uh, no, now I'm doing it wrong. Um, <coughs> three and a half cents per kilowatt hour which again is cheaper than anything uh, you can do with fossil fuels in this part of the world. So it seems to be that these technologies are at the verge of becoming competitive, if not past the verge. Uh, there are of course problems with wind and solar. <coughs> and cost is no longer one, uh, but they're visually intrusive. And for that reason in the UK you just can't build new wind turbines on land, so now we put them uh, at sea, right? Um, so they're further away, of course, if you're on Brighton Beach, you can see them still, right? But not as much as if they're on land. Uh, so that is an issue. Um, solar has an issue with waste. It hasn't got to, quite gotten to light uh, yet, but photovoltaic panels are full of uh, nasty chemicals and if you take a photovoltaic panel off your roof you have chemical waste. Uh, we haven't taken many off so this has not quite manifested itself. Um, 
but there's definitely gonna be an issue there. Uh, another problem with wind and solar is that they're intermittent and often unpredictable. Wind is particularly unpredictable. And that means uh, that you somehow need to store the energy in a battery or in pumped hydro or something like that, uh, maybe in hydrogen, and that is kind of that adds to the cost. A good thing is that because of uh, <coughs> because of uh, mobile phones and laptops, battery costs have come down rapidly as well. So the cost of storing uh, electricity <coughs> has improved too. Uh, another problem with wind and solar is that the wind blows in Europe on the Atlantic seaboard. <coughs> So that's the west of Ireland, and of course most people live in London, so you need to transport the electricity. The best sun is in the Sahara. It's not where the people are, right? Uh, so you have a transport problem as well. <coughs> um, and electricity is good for laptops and for lighting. Uh, it's not so good for heating, and it's definitely not good for transport. Um, so you need to do something else uh, there um, but also here uh, there's been rapid technological uh, problems so at the moment uh, you must all have heard of biofuels uh, and we are sort of in the first generation of biomass and uh, the first generation of biomass is essentially that you press seeds to get oil out of it and you mix it in with petrol and diesel diesel um, and that's one option or what they do uh, in drags at the moment you cut down forests uh, in the US and Canada you chip up the uh, wood you ship it here and then you put it into uh, what used to be a coal fired power plant but now is essentially a wood fired power plant uh, that's the first generation of biomass there's um, issues with that one is the cost uh, this is uh, expensive uh, but uh, more problematic, this biomass directly competes with food. So George W. Bush uh, introduced an ethanol mandate in U.S. automotive fuels, which essentially says that 25% of the petrol or diesel that you stick in your car has to come from biofuels. And essentially, the cheapest source of biofuels is maize or corn, depending which side of the Atlantic you're on. So, U.S. farmers grow large amounts of this, and then it essentially gets processed into fuel. The problem is that this drives up the price of tortillas. <coughs> and we can eat this stuff too. The stuff that is burned in the cars is something that could feed a human or a pig for that matter or a cow. So there's direct competition with food in terms of the stuff that you grow but of course also the land uh, that you use. <coughs> so that's the first generation biomass. Uh, they're now working as you may have guessed on the second generation. The second generation is the same thing but with smarter processing. So better presses, membranes, cleverer ways of drying stuff, and so on and so forth. Um, not going to get you there, you're still competing with food, and you still have an issue with the processing. <coughs> so what is biomass? Essentially a recently diseased tree, or recently harvested corn. That is biomass. What is a fossil fuel? essentially plant material as well, but plant material that is millions of years old and over time by Mother Nature has been dried and compressed and everything until you have a nice lump of coal that contains a lot of energy. If you have a field of rapeseed, as you can see around you uh, in a few months time again in Sussex, <coughs> yes there's all these seeds there that contain a lot of oil, but what you need to do as a farmer is First, you need to grow the stuff, then you need to harvest the stuff. You have this enormous amount of material. You need to dry it, you need to compress it, you need to transport it to a processing uh, facility, and then they're going to press it and take out the oil. Right? There's an enormous amount of work. <coughs> Whereas if you just have oil in Saudi Arabia, it's the same thing, right? but it has been processed for free by Mother Nature for millions of years. That's the difference between uh, biomass and fossil fuels. 
So these things, it's hard to see that they would ever compete. But fortunately, after the second generation comes the third generation. And uh, what is happening in the third generation? Well, if you look at plants that we use for food, they have drastically changed, right? Uh, so this is the wild mustard, brassica, and through a process of uh, selective breeding, mustard, which we still use by the way, uh, has turned into cauliflower, into broccoli, into kale, into kohlrabi, into Brussels sprouts, and into carrots. Some of you may not like some of these foods, but it's quite impressive how same plants, right? And this was done through selective breeding over a period of 3,000 years or so. So the plants that we use for food have changed dramatically over a relatively short period. And are now much better at feeding us because cauliflower, whether you like it or not, has much more nutritional value than mustard. Right? If you look at the plants that we're currently using for energy, they're still the same as they were a thousand years ago. We haven't even, 20 years ago, we haven't even started to select, selectively breed plants for energy. That has now changed. Um, of course, we are no longer sort of farmers in Mesopotamia <laughs> experimenting with plants, not quite knowing what genetics is and so on and so forth. We now have very deep knowledge of genetics. We have very deep knowledge of gene uh, selective breeding. Um, and that means that we can foresee very rapid technological progress there. And some of these things are already happening in the lab. Um, none of it has come out of the lab and into the market, uh, but you can expect very rapid progress there. Uh, the most impressive thing still in my mind <coughs> is that they've manipulated algae to make diesel oil. Essentially what you need is a vat of water throw in those algae, you come back three days later and there's a film of oil on the top of your water and you just scoop it up and stick it in your car and drive away. That is now possible in the lab through genetic manipulation of algae. Um, <coughs> and you can expect major breakthroughs in this over the next 10, 20 years, right? <coughs> so, <coughs> to sum up, right? Yes, it is feasible to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But it's not easy, right? And all of these things come with their own drawbacks, come with their own costs. But technically, it's very well possible. The one thing that I haven't said is that if we add up the energy contained in all these renewables, the amount of solar energy that we receive, the amount of wind energy, the amount of wave energy, then we have more energy to, say, to satisfy the world's and current world's energy needs 10 times, 100 times over. So these are not physically constrained or anything. What is constraining them are costs, technologies, convenience, those sort of things, all those sort of things that we can overcome if we uh, apply ourselves <coughs> to it, right? So that's all I wanted to say. I have only 15 minutes left. Uh, I've been talking way more slowly um then i should have um so who has read scott barrett's paper what does he say um he's saying that emissions reduction is hard um because of the free rider problem and the alternative would be to geoengineer because it's way, way cheaper to do. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also a problem with this world, and that's done by one collective solar radiation, by increasing the amount of dust in the atmosphere. And then, but then there's a problem because there's some countries that will benefit from climate change, and some that will suffer. So who is going to be the one that decides? 
what is the level of geoengineering that we create <coughs> and who's going to do it. Mm -hmm. That's a correct summary for those who have read the paper. <coughs> Did we all understand this? So what is geoengineering? Always break down problems into small steps, right? What is the geoengineering that Barrett is talking about? Yes. Uh, so I talked about aerosols, right? That uh, we've actually emitted a lot of sulfur through the years and that has a net cooling effect. What you can just do is put more of those things into the atmosphere. And this is incredibly cheap. And that is where the incredible uh, Barrett comes from. Why is it cheap? Because those sulfur particles cause acid rain. So what we have been doing over the last couple of decades is take the sulfur out of flue gas. We put scrubbers on uh, coal-fired power plants to take the sulfur out. And as a result, we now have heaps and heaps and heaps of sulfur that we don't know what to do with. One thing we could do is, in a slightly different chemical uh, composition, stick them back into the atmosphere, and it has to be a different chemical exposition, a composition, because we don't want to create more acid rain, right? But if we do put the right sulfur up there, it has a cooling effect. The good thing is that sulfur is a waste product. We have so much of it that we don't know what, what to do with it. So it comes for free. People might pay you to take the sulfur off their hands. Um, and you can put them in the atmosphere and enough to make a serious dent in, um, in the temperature it's flying four 747s constantly to dump the stuff out there. So essentially your budget is that of a small airline, right? That is what you need. So we're talking about a few hundred million per year. Maybe that. So that is very cheap, right? And recall that the world economy is measured in trillions, right? <coughs> so 100 million is just very, very difficult. Right. So what is wrong with this proposal? Why don't we just do it? And I was pointing at you. You actually summarize it correctly, why don't we just do it? Go ahead. Uh, I haven't read the paper, but I just guess, I guess. Um, I'm guessing the world is so complex that having to make it possible to, to actually push forward these actions is pretty difficult. As in to have like a principal agent responsible for actually with the actual emissions out of some world. It's, it's always game theory, it's just always waiting for someone else to do it, and you just want to be right the whole thing. But suppose that you are the president of the Maldives, and you are desperate. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I guess it's hard to protect the state is so complex as well. I don't know. What is complex? Asia, the ecosystem. So that is the first rollback, right? So <coughs> last week I talked about climate science, and one of the things that you must have gotten from me is that this is an incredibly complex system, and a system that we only partially understand. <coughs> so the proposal here is to take the system and accept climate change as it is, through greenhouse gas emissions, and then change it back by adding an additional complication to the system, right? You may say, this is risky. We take a system we don't understand, we push it in this direction, and now we're going to come up with an intervention and we're going to push it back to where we want it to be. And hope that things come all right. That's a tricky thing, and I think that is what you were trying to say, right? <laughs> um, and the good thing about sulfur is that it has an atmospheric lifetime of around 14 days. 
So if we put too little in, we can just put more sulfur into the atmosphere. If we put too much in, and it gets cooler, but those effects will have disappeared pretty soon. We will have one very cold winter and one failed harvest. Right? But that is sort of the maximum of the damage that we can do, and then we would have learned. And perhaps if we're overdoing it, right? <coughs> so that uncertainty is controllable, but still, you have a peculiar. Uh, you have a lot of uncertainty around. It. Another complication is that you don't take away the source of the problem, right? What you say, you can emit as much CO2 as you want. We're going to undo the effect by putting more sulfur into the atmosphere. That means that there's no reason to reduce CO2, so presumably that just keeps growing, and we just keep putting more and more sulfur into the atmosphere. And it's a very small program, right? Presumably controlled by NASA or somebody. And then there is climate change essentially disappeared, so you no longer have a democratic mandate to keep on doing this, because there's no more climate change, so what do we care? And then you have an idiot like Trump come along and say, oh, we can save some money here. <coughs> Let's shut down this program, right? Or the pilots of those planes may go on strike. or a terrorist may decide to blow up those planes, right? You build in, you build a lot of reliance on what is essentially a small system that is easily taken out for whatever reason, political uh, accidents, industrial action, terrorists. So you create an enormous vulnerability there, right? <coughs> now, what is the... Uh, final problem that Barrett uh, talks about and that you alluded to as well and I just alluded to too. Go ahead. Responsibility on the action. Who is in charge? Yes. Right? Because essentially what you're saying here is we're going to manipulate the climate, we're going to choose to put a certain amount of sulfur in the atmosphere and cool the planet by 3 degrees. And the people in India will rejoice when you say we're going to make it 3 degrees cooler. And the people in Finland will say, really? Is that what you want to do? And then the question is, how do you, at the moment, we just accept the climate that's given, right? It's just something that we can't do anything about, so there's no reason to fight about it. Um, <coughs> but if you can choose the climate that you have, then you have a reason to fight with each other, right? And uh, that is true for sulfur. Uh, there's other proposals for geoengineering. <coughs> um, one of the ones that sounds most sci-fi but sort of highlights this particular problem uh, is to put mirrors in space. So all of our sunlight, of all of our energy comes eventually from the sun. Um, actually the way the positions of the things and most sunlight actually passes through a relatively narrow area of space the so-called first lagrangian point l1 and if you put a mirror in the lagrangian point the, 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 the lagrangian area is not that big so and if you put a few mirrors there that are maybe 100 meters wide or so uh, satellites like that you can actually substantially reduce the temperature of planet earth simply by preventing sunlight uh, from coming in. <coughs> and there the question of control becomes very important, right? Because who can put those things up there? The Americans, the Chinese, the Japanese probably if they want, and the Europeans. 
and presumably it's the Americans or the Chinese that are going to do it. And that means that if we had, say, the President Obama would have built this mirror, then we would have all been happy because he's a responsible guy. And he would cool it down a little bit. And then all of a sudden he would be succeeded by Trump. And he would be in charge of these mirrors. That becomes very scary, right? So the issue there of control becomes very important in sort of creating the robust institutions, the international institutions, to make sure that these technologies are not abused, are very important, right? Uh, and that's the big, uh, the third big problem with uh, gene engineering. <coughs> Very uncertain, hard to control, but incredibly cheap.